All right, can you all hear me? Okay. My name is Kristen Sweet. I am here from Thomson Reuters, and I am also representing Johnson & Johnson. Um, it's specifically, I've been working with the Janssen immunology team, and I am here today to talk about the different ways that this group is using Transmart. And they're using Transmart really as a true translational platform from all stages, from bench to bedside. And so I'm going to be highlighting some of the use cases. So I thought I'd start with an overview of what J&J &J instance of Transmart looks like. So they have a variety of different data types coming from clinical trials, um, some in vitro and preclinical studies, and then some public studies as well. And they use a variety of types of data, your baseline demographic information, disease status, medical history, um, and then the endpoints, so uh, study endpoints, efficacy measurements, pharmacokinetics, lab measurements, uh, and obviously the biomarker data as high dimensional data. So as I said, Transmart is used at Janssen for all stages of translational medicine. So from the basic research side of things, we have hypothesis generation and preclinical data analysis. And then on the more application-based side of the spectrum, Transmart is used in clinical trial design, efficacy endpoints, and evaluating drug functionality. So I like to think of the way that Transmart can be used as two different ways. The first is being, uh, the first being looking directly at the results of the study as it was intended to be used. So that is looking at the endpoint of the study and looking at the efficacy. So some examples, I'll go into these a little bit more in detail later, but um, looking at percent improvement and change over time versus drug treated versus placebo treatment, looking at disease severity and how that may relate to uh, lab parameters, and then looking at response and how that might correlate to the prior use of a drug. So these are all ways that you can use the study data directly in its own little circle. However, you can also use this data as metadata and as a way to leap forward and reflect on your clinical trial design and optimize that study by better understanding your patient population in this disease area. So example here would be, uh, do patients have a cutoff value below a certain threshold at baseline that we should keep in mind for designing a futures trial? And so the first use case highlights that second point that I was mentioning. So this study was, uh, the objective here was to look at CRP levels in COPD patients. So COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And this is an inflammatory condition of the lung that's characterized by shortness of breath and a chronic cough. And one of the markers for COPD disease severity is C-reactive protein, or CRP. And this is a marker of inflammation for both uh, COPD as well as many other inflammatory conditions. So the aim that the scientists had to address here was to understand the percentage of patients that had cutoff values of CRP below a th certain threshold at baseline. And so to do this, they used a prior COPD study that was in Transmart as a reference. And so the first thing that we did here is using this previous COPD study, simply look at the overall CRP levels in this population. And we saw they ranged from zero to approximately 12. And we saw the majority of patients seemed to have a CRP level of less than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. So next, we um, drilled down into that to be able to see that histogram a little bit more clearly and restricted our CRP population to less than two. And we saw here is now you can clearly see um, the histogram and how these patients restrict how these patients um, are distributed. And so we are able to use the grade 
view and the export functionalities to take this data. Um, and so this, while this is not the uh, maybe most interesting case, the reason why I included this study is this is a conversation that I overheard in the cafeteria while I was heating up my lunch. And before the microwave was finished, I was able to get her the answer and have her emailing this file to her boss. So this is a great use of Transmart and the scientist was able to get their information very quickly and easily. The next use case is uh, looking at placebo response in a rheumatoid arthritis study. And so for those of you who are not familiar with a uh, clinical trial, when you have a when you have a study where you're treating patients with drug versus placebo, the ultimate goal is you want your drug-treated patients to respond, while your placebo patients, you hope they maintain relatively stable. If you have a high level of placebo response, you can end up skewing your data and basically making your efficacy look not as good as it is. And so they had this problem of high levels of placebo responders in rheumatoid arthritis studies and wanted to see, is there any baseline characteristic? Can we predict who will be a placebo responder um, to be able to maybe exclude these patients from a future study? And so they did this in two ways. Uh, they wanted to look at other efficacy measurements that may be associated with treatment response, and then also to look at the use of prior medications. So for response, they used an ACR20, which is an American College of Rheumatology score. Um, this measures a 20% response from baseline in uh, joint severity. And so they looked at how does this correlate with prior use of medication. So just to show you how we set up our cohorts, we set both uh, populations to have received placebo. And then subset one are patients who did not respond, and subset two are our placebo responders. And what we could see is that treatment failure of uh, previous treatment with NSAIDs, uh, which is in the top, and um, DMARDs, second, did not seem to correlate with response. So what this means is that patients were not more likely or less likely to respond to this drug based on a prior treatment that they had received. So next, using that same endpoint of ACR20 response, they wanted to look at a change over time in another measurement, the health assessment questionnaire score. So this is a test that the patient reports um, their limitations and how much the disease is affecting their life and limiting them. And so they wanted to look over time at uh, drug versus placebo-treated patients who responded. And so using the line graph functionality in Transmart, they were able to look at the distribution over time for these two groups. The next story is also in rheumatoid arthritis. And this is looking at haptoglobin and hemoglobin levels in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And so um, when a red blood cell lyses, it releases hemoglobin into the bloodstream. And haptoglobin is a protein that binds free, hemo he binds free hemoglobin in the blood, and it just degrades it. And why is this important in rheumatoid arthritis patients? A bunch of previous work has shown in vitro and in vivo, that haptoglobin levels correlate with disease severity. So um, haptoglobin levels are increased in rheumatoid arthritis patients, and um, which makes sense, right? If you're having uh, higher levels of haptoglobin, then you're going to have lower hemoglobin levels, and then you're going to have uh, more anemia. And this is important because anemia has been associated with disease severity in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So we wanted to see in our rheumatoid arthritis studies, how does that look? And can we replicate these findings in patient populations? So we stratified our patients into two groups. 
uh, subset one are clinically diagnosed with anemia based on their hemoglobin levels of less than 12. And subset two is patients who are normal for hemoglobin. And we looked at how this correlates with four different tests for rheumatoid arthritis disease severity. So I'll take you through them. The first one is a um, DAS-28 score. So this is a disease area severity score. And we saw that in patients who have low hemoglobin, they have significantly uh, higher severity scores. On the bottom here is the health assessment questionnaire that I spoke of earlier. And again, we saw that the more anemic patients had uh, significantly worse scores. On the top here is the physician global assessment. So this is a uh, patient, a physician reported uh, score based on a visual analog scale. And we saw again that it is significantly correlated with uh, disease severity. And on the bottom is the patient reported, um, similar to the, the physician score, but this is based on patient reporting. And again, we see um, this one's not significant, but we do see the same trend where more severe disease correlates with uh, having low hemoglobin levels. So the good thing about Transmart is you do this in one study, if you want to look in another study, you just put this study in the box and you can do the whole thing all over again. So now we use the second study. Um, the scale here is a little differently. So um, the other one was in milligrams per deciliter. And so we were able to replicate the same results. Um, I won't go through them again, but we basically saw the same trend for, the same, for this other population. So these all show that uh, RA disease severity is associated with anemia. And so the conclusions here, uh, Janssen is really using Transmart as a true translational medicine program. They span from all different stages from bench work all the way through to late phase clinical trials. And by integrating clinical trial data and biomarker data, scientists are able to hypothesize and answer those hypotheses very quickly. And the new R interface will help scientists to be able to further perform analyses. And I want to thank the um, Janssen Immunology Group, the Transmart Foundation, and my team at Thompson Reuters. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? So do you know if anyone else in J&J is using the Transmart system besides the immunology group at this point in time? Are they using it in any of the therapeutic, other therapeutic areas? In this instance, it's only the immunology group. Um, some of the other groups have used Transmart um, as part of collaborations with other groups specifically. Um, and that's something that uh, J&J's hopefully implementing more and more Transmart in their other disciplines. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, he is probably in the, uh, yeah, Jonathan Cornaby. He is, uh, he's at Janssen. He is on the IT side, so he's probably in the coding part of this talk. Yeah, I could maybe add to that that um, J and J, for example, has within the EMIF project in Europe, they have uh, a number of instances um, where we work on Alzheimer's disease and also on metabolic diseases. And um, yeah, there's a couple more. It's a large company, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Uncle Chai also, right? Um, any other questions? So maybe um, since you know, we talked about different use cases uh, within uh, j and I was wondering, is it, it sounds like there's a multiple instance of Transmart rather than, say, one instance of Transmart, right? Yeah. Okay. 
so um, that that's actually good to know as well, because um, you know I think in some other companies, if you know, are we trying to jam all the data in, in one instance? Are, are the um, data from different disease area may maybe really kind of different, and then they may use different you know, um, ontologies, and uh, so it could be you know imaginable. So. Right, and I think that the reason for having different instances is mostly for um, access and data sharing purposes also. So for different collaborations, they tend to use different instances um, just to, to make it more simple in terms of collaborations with outside groups. Okay, maybe in, in Jensen, you, I don't know if you can comment on this at all, in terms of the security model, the access model that's, um, you know, one question often surface as well. How is that handled? And that may be a better question for Jonathan. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I think that was also a question which came up with our consortium frequently. You know, is there a system available to do tiered access? Uh, so that you can designate certain segments of the data set accessible by a specified user only. And that particularly if you have a diverse user community and data at various maturations being uh, integrated uh, in Transmart, it would be highly useful. And I don't know if in, I have, I'm not aware that with 1.2 you have that implemented or did you? The tiered access system. I don't think in, in point two they tackled the data uh, access model. I think in um, that that's a good point because I, at least right now it seems that access is based on is project based. So you either have full access to the project data or have zero access to the project data. Yeah. So access used to be done um, as uh, on the study level, and yeah. now. Um, We've switched to the system of doing it by disease area, just for simplicity. And so we've binned um, the users into disease area that they focus on, and then they can apply for access for that disease area. Um, we just found it makes it simpler than requesting each study one by one. Okay. Um, let's see, do we... Um... No, no. So all of the immunology uh, is under this instance, and then we just have different access for uh, different disease areas. So the studies will be grayed out, and they'll only be able to open the study nodes for the actual studies that they have access to. So Janssen as a company does have many instances. So they have an internal instance, and then they'll have therapeutic area instances, and then they'll have collaboration instances. Um, and depending on all of those phenomena and that, they'll have different data sets in them as well. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of combinations there. So how many IT groups actually <laughs> manage all these different <laughs> instances? <laughs> So I think there's a lot there's a lot of service groups supporting Janssen and that, but they they only have one internal IT group. And Jonathan Cornebe is here, and they're I mean they're blasted that they've got so much work to do and that they can't handle all of it. So oh, you can do it in a couple of days and that. So um, we're, we're Rancho Biosciences. So for our examples, we have um, hosted um, versions. And we'll talk about one that we're, we've been officially allowed to talk about today, but the, they can be hosted with multiple companies. The example we give is going to be with Amazon Web Services, but they can do it with other third parties and internal and multiple internal instance, internal instances as well as multiple cloud instances. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Let's just thank Kristen one more thank time. You.